Welcome back to another episode of the Peaky Pod by Story Archives. We are officially on episode three of season three. I think we've hit the midway point, if I'm looking at the episodes correct. I do believe this is the midway point. Yeah, well, I'm your host, Mario, alongside your other host. Zachary, welcome. I'm your other host. And um, yeah, this is the official midway point. We have six episodes in season three. And honestly, upon rewatch, I am very much enjoying this season more than I remembered I had. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. Same. No, that, that's what I've been saying in the last episode or two, and I, I totally agree. It's also very, very interesting seeing all the dots start to connect. There's a lot of nuances in the dialogue in this season. A lot of things that are said underneath the radar that mm-hmm. are future developments that are to come in the series at, at a certain Absolutely. point. Absolutely. And they just literally, it'll just be one sentence that they say something extremely major. And you'll have to rewind and be like, did they just say that? Mm-hmm. And that's like kind of been all over each of these episodes. But I think specifically in this one, in a lot of ways, because we're kind of coming down from the freneticness of the previous two episodes in this one. This is a, a much calmer paced episode. Yeah, right. that's we, for sure. You have the come down from Grace's death at the dinner. And we go from mm-hmm. wedding to death, and death has done them part. And now we are with uh, the aftermath of what's left of Tommy. Because, you know, you get this beautiful picture of what the Shelby family could be at the end mm-hmm. of the previous episode. And then we open up season three, uh, not season three, episode three with just this cold, gloomy sort of um, li- the life that's left behind. You know, yeah. the mess that's left behind in Grace's death. And you, I th- for me personally, immediately I kind of thought of Charlie, Tommy's yeah. son, in in sense of, oh man, any life or any semblance of a regular family life for that kid has just gone out the window. That is for yeah, sure. Cause it's just it opens up with Tommy sitting by this fire by himself, mm-hmm. and it's just what's going to happen with this character now. He's so much on the edge. He has so much ambition. But in ver- it felt like Grace was kind of that thing tying it together for him that gave him a purpose mm-hmm. for his grand ambitions, right? Because he's at the end of the day, he's bringing it back to his family, something for them to inherit and whatnot. And now it's just he's there. And I don't think Tommy's meant to be the single father, if you know what I mean. No, I definitely don't think he, he's meant to be a single father. Uh, it, th- between last episode and this one, it really feels like, I guess you could say we've been rugged. We've all been rugged. It, it, we we got this nice picture of what his life could be, and that's just completely gone at this point. Yeah, even notice like the colors throughout the episode are very desaturated. You mm-hmm. know, it's just like this this film of gray has been put on top of the entire thing. The weather's gloomy. Yeah. It's just you know, Tommy does look cool as like the gloomy, disheveled. Uh, a <laughs> guy left to remain though <laughs> yeah. you know there's always a semblance like he never loses his coolness in some sense right no he doesn't i mean you can't lose your coolness if you're tom if, if you never eat you're always cool so is that true no, besides for him through? apparently i'm like the <laughs> least cool person ever then eating all the time yeah that's it three <laughs> meals a day squ- three square <laughs> meals pal oh man i can only have two yeah no, i'm not a breakfast man i've become i love a the breakfast, breakfast food I've gotten back into the breakfast, you know, I just, and maybe like, uh, I can go most of the day and just do breakfast and dinner most of the time, mm-hmm. unless, you know, I need something in the midday for like a pick me up or whatever, but usually lunch is smaller than the rest. Yeah. We had, Wait, how do you, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to comment on uh, the fact that he's just immediately back to business mode. Yeah, what I, I mean, I guess you need like some sort of passion or something to do at that point. You need a mission. Yeah, so we see Tommy's been out of the house the entire time, and he's kind of like reverting back to gypsy ways in some sense, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but he comes back to this. His desk is messy. I don't think I've ever seen it like this messy before. And you can tell that he's totally just out of sorts. He's just trying to leave things in order so that he can go off and do what he needs to do, right? Yeah. It seems like he's just giving orders and getting a. A report of what's going on in each thing, but he's really not there. And we have uh, essentially the, there's like a pecking order in terms of how Tommy's meeting with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, 
I mean, I, li- I like the whole, you know, bit that we get into in a moment, but uh, him picking Polly and Michael first, it kind of, I, I, it definitely feels like a slap in the face, especially if you're John or, or Michael. I'm like, I'm not, not Michael, John or Arthur, in my opinion. Yeah. But he does give a good reason for it, honestly. Like, I get it. I get it. Like, Grace, Grace is the the positive side of things, right? Like she, she's like the legitimate part of his life. And that's what he's focusing on first. I can't help but think that the reason he's meeting with Michael and Polly first is also not kind of subliminally a slap in the face to his brothers. Um, that it's some sort of resentment for them causing this Italian vendetta to begin with that led to Grace's death. Now, you know, ultimately Tommy did make the decision to double mm-hmm. down on, on John's um, hot-headedness. Oh, yeah. But it kind of feels like that. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's just the insecurity of John and Arthur showing forth here, per usual, being selfish when Tommy's in a, in a position of, of grief. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I, I, don't, I don't know if if this has to do more with the fact that they're kind of like the catalyst for this or not, because I mean, Tommy really did double down. That's almost an understatement on, on how passionately he went about what, what John boy started. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even here, we're just carrying it out even, even farther. Although this bit, I get, this is more of a, a revenge thing. Yeah. He's, they're However, there. He's already starting to go. They're there the to give a report on, what happened as a as retaliation to the Changretas, and we find out that Angel Changretta uh, has been killed, which is the son that started all this, who was going out with Lizzie, mm-hmm. and the Italians have been cast out of their territory and sent into the uh, to the the back country, or what? Is, what does it John call it? I don't know what he called it. I think he says they've been sent into. I don't know. Either the black country or the back country. Because I know you have the... Probably the back country. You know? No, but wasn't there a company... Wasn't there like a There group? was the black country boys. The black was, country. Uh, That's why I'm saying like black country boys. Because he mentions that there's, a, I think, a gypsy that he's talking to. He told them to keep it moving. That they mm-hmm. wanted the Italians out of there too. So that's why I assumed it had something to do with Billy Kitchen's people. Uh, which were RIP Billy Kitchen season two. But... Yeah. With that being said, John takes an opportunity. It's mainly him being selfish in terms of confronting Tommy in my favorite scene of the episode and, and maybe the season of... Uh, <laughs> favorite of the season. Wow. Spoke Already. to Michael before us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that... It's just a great scene altogether. But... Yeah. Uh, Tommy wants to give him order to take Changara to shoot his wife and to save it, save Changara for him. Changreta mm-hmm. Sr., that is, before he's off yeah. to... Uh, he's trying to escape to New York because obviously the target wasn't Grace. It was to kill Tommy. Yep. Uh, but he hires, like, I don't know who the hell he hired as a hitman. I don't know why hitmans have to announce their killing before they've done it, you know? I don't know either. That's, I don't get it. It's it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like all of these old well, would we, shows. Would James we, Bond <laughs> villains explaining everything yeah. before. Would we be watching this show if, if Tommy was killed and Grace took over the Shelby Company Limited? <laughs> I don't think so. Probably not, no. I don't think so. Well, like, if you're going to kill one of them, you got to kill them all at this point, honestly. Yeah. You can't, y- you know, you're not going to live. In watching this episode, I had always remembered the explosion scene with John and, and Tommy of like how they just get at it, go at each other. Mm-hmm. But I never realized until watching it this time that John and Arthur were under the assumption that there was to be a family meeting, not that the family would be divided, mm-hmm. which is in- interesting because it kind of becomes a theme in this episode. A family unified cannot be taken, torn apart. That's, that's the toast that Polly gives right before we see Tommy uh, take off in a wagon with Johnny dogs to the middle of the countryside. And Charlie. And Charlie. Yeah. It's <sighs> Tommy seems like he just needs to get away from everybody to get mm-hmm. straight, you know, uh, and what we find out is that he's on his mission to find absolution. But I want to talk yeah. a little more about John and Arthur. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be a pattern that whenever they're left to their own devices, they cause more trouble. And I'll, I will double down on that assertion because it starts with the meeting with Changretta Sr., the leader of the Changretas. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and it follows up with this episode where they're really going at Michael for for just following orders. You know, I get it. Mm-hmm. Michael kind of looks like this kind of arrogant up and comer who's getting everything handed to him, and they're very much the the soldiers who have had to do the dirty work for the last however many years. Uh, yeah. But Michael's following orders at the end of the day. And I, but I do think they, they feel like the writings on the wall that Tommy's chosen him to be the boss, right? In some sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but later in this episode, we see that they kind of awaken a, a wild side to Michael that I wonder if, if his purpose is to keep the legitimate side of the Peaky Blinders intact, mm-hmm. how wise is it for them to muddy that? Because you constantly see Polly trying to get them away from Michael. You know, they're just like bad eggs, John and Arthur. They can, yeah. they're good. They're great characters. They're good at what they do. But around someone like Michael or even, you know, their wives, they kind of get dragged into the mud, you know? Mm-hmm. Look at Esme. You know, she's doing uh, cocaine as she's pregnant, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, when you're a Shelby, I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cocaine no. is the magical drug. But Ada doesn't, you know, when Ada's, yes. when Ada's pregnant, she doesn't do it. Maybe when, when Ada was stupid in season one, she was, but, mm-hmm. uh, but not cocaine. She was drinking. Yeah. At the, I think it was John Boy's wedding, actually. But You know, one other thing that, that I mean, kind of, kind of a sidebar, um, but I just find it very interesting. And I always forget about the fact that John Boy and Finn... In real life, uh, or not, not fan, John Boy and Michael in real life are brothers. So it's really interesting to see that, that dynamic. You just reminded um, me of that. I had forgotten. Yeah, I completely forgot. It's uh, John is Joe Cole, I believe, and Michael is Finn Cole. But yeah, they're both brothers, which is, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's interesting to keep in mind as, as they do these scenes. But they, they feel they like, really well together. they just feel like they're not related in some way at oh, all i know you know exactly they don't really look like each other they at look all. very different in my yeah. opinion yeah how, how about this I, I always wonder in episodes like this of peaky blinders as they're in the countryside almost completely mm-hmm. if this is a lower budget episode for them because the the landscapes look so picturesque you know yeah yeah they do I almost feel like they would have to be like lower, but I mean, there's only what, one set. What piece. is the set at this? It, it, it's a caravan. I mean, it's good art direction. I'm sure they're putting leaves across the ground too. They didn't just find it like that. Oh, um, of course. But it, it still feels like almost like maybe I, I mentioned in, in episode one and two the set pieces felt huge. You know, the wedding, and then even last episode, I'd say the wedding felt like the grandest of all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but. This episode feels kind of like that in the can episode, like where you get like you're setting the groundwork for what's to come in the rest of the season. But you got to yeah. say you got to save money on one of these episodes, you know, and really you only get a few uh, locations here. You get the mansion, you mm-hmm. get the countryside and you get um, another dining room mansion. Um I guess there are quite a few locations. Definitely upping the ante from season one. I'll tell you that. Like, when you go back yeah. and watch season one, it's a, it's night and day. Oh, yeah. It's, like, all in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it's all in, like, the Birmingham area that feels very much, like, closed in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. There's also not a lot of scenes in here with a lot of people. Like, the the... Especially when you compare it to the last two with the party and the wedding. Like, that was... Yes. You just know those two yes. episodes were very expensive. And long to so, make. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe not. Yeah, probably long to make for sure. But the... I, I would also imagine the next episode is going to... I mean, I've seen it, but it's been a while since I've seen it. But I'm going to assume that the next episode is going to kind of have a similar feel to this and just being more of, like, the budget episode, the setup. Well... You know, I I do feel like in shows like this, you do need to set the ground. And all the the ground is usually laid in dialogue, you know? So, mm-hmm. you do have to ramp it up for the last few episodes that are coming in some sense. So, yeah. even if it's a mix of like half, you know, like this scene where you have Arthur and John in this episode and Michael, mm-hmm. who are pretty much showing Michael what it's like to hold a gun and to point it at a man and to have that power over him to take their life. You know, yeah. they're showing him that, which is like, in my opinion, a dangerous thing to do with Michael. 
considering his position in the company and, and what Tommy has in store for him. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's just another reason, like it's just unwise shit that they do. But you know, yeah, yeah. I I also absolutely love the face that John Boy makes. It's just <laughs> it's hilarious. There, Arthur fe- not, feels unfazed. Unfazed. Oh yeah. Even though it's a Webley and the hammer might go off accidentally, but you know, um, I'm not going to call out what, what they are, but there are definitely a few screw ups in this episode. And I feel like things would be different if they didn't screw things up. Yeah. Like there, there's a few key moments in here. You're just like, ah, why? Yeah. You see, like, you notice after they're done kind of giving Michael the the runaround and Michael gets this kind of chip on his shoulder where he, you know, he tells Polly, I'm not a kid anymore. You know, it's mm-hmm. like a new page is turning for Michael pretty soon where yeah. Polly's not going to be able to control everything he does because she comes out there and she looks at Arthur in a way that's like realizing that fact that, like, you know, the longer she's around these two, Mm-hmm the more trouble he's going to get into. Right? Yeah. Now, talk about Arthur and John Boy being shots, huh? Yeah. Every single bottle they hit on the thing as Polly's just looking <laughs> at them. I, I always love this scene where Polly's looking at them almost, to me, in her eyes, it's almost like she's seeing the boys that she saw grew up who were innocent boys, mm-hmm. and she's seeing them now as war-torn uh, war-torn gangsters, you know, yeah. or just violent, you know, who have pretty much their life is set before them as, as these violent criminals, you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I always kind of found it interesting the way she looks at them as they're shooting, you know, and it, they're they're necessary for the organization, but I think people forget that they have to do some extremely difficult things. Yeah. Immoral, immoral, difficult things, violent things, right? As we see in the next scene that Tommy's left them to go and pretty much do the rounds for him uh, Mm -hmm. where they go and visit Nutley, who's the factory manager. And dude has an iconic face, doesn't he? Like Nutley looks like one of those old timey 1940s actors. Yeah, he does. He looks like somebody you've seen before. You just can't place him. Yeah. And I'm sure we have. If If we found out what actor this is, I'm sure we know him from a movie or a tv show but the plan here is to fire all of the communist workers at the factory uh within the next six weeks because what's happening as i understand it and correct me if i'm wrong is they need to move this military equipment for the russians out of england so that they can fight off the socialists Mm -hmm. are they socialists or communists i think they would be communists the bolsheviks they got to fight the bolsheviks so they need to cause like disruption in the factory so they can have a distraction on the 21st mm-hmm. of June. That's the date that they, that they use in the show so that the trains can take off. And Tommy gives his whole plan and his dinner with the, with the Russian royalties and the perverted priest and, uh, and the other random guy who, to me, I see no purpose for him because uh, up until now we get nothing from him. I don't even mm-hmm. remember his name, Patrick Jarvis, some shit like that. Something like that. I can't remember either. Yeah. I I don't remember what happens in season three with Nutley, but they make such mm-hmm. a big thing about him taking the money. And it almost feels yeah. like maybe there is nothing for Nutley. Maybe it's just putting you in the shoes of, hey, these are the people you root for, and this is how they destroy good men. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's, it's just kind of like a little jab at the audience. Like, look at who you root for. You <laughs> Look at these criminals you root for. Yeah. All right. You want to take this portrait scene with Polly? Uh, yeah. I mean, Polly's with the weird artist that we we saw a little little while ago in the last episode, which I still don't understand his relevance in this, or where he came from, and, and why he's really here. Where he came from is my biggest question. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I wish I knew. Um, but yeah. I mean, she she's all dolled up here. He, he's painting her. And kind of, kind of gives a jab at him, basically, you know, saying, "Oh, what are, you, are you telling your friends that you're painting a gangster?" You know, really trying to play into the, uh, 
the power that the Shelbys have. It's almost um, kind of like what Tommy asked May Carlton last season. Mm. You get a kick out of this, you know, dating the gangster, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think they, they know it makes them popular, but I guess it, it also, I mean, if people are drawn to you just for that reason, it's not, it's probably not very good. He's he's definitely a plot device for Polly in a way, because in a sense, she is developing as a character even more. Because she mm-hmm. gives like this long talk in the kitchen family meeting earlier in the episode where she says, you know, look at this house you're in. Let's start behaving like we belong here. And that's yeah. not kind of the tone she was taking beforehand. Um, she was acting more like uh, that the parents left the house rather than uh, that they own the house necessarily. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That that totally makes sense. Anyways. The artist, who I cannot remember the name of, basically tells her that he wants to seduce her eventually. Yeah, I mean, who couldn't have seen that so, coming? Yeah, I know. It's just like, okay. I'm not sure how that guy was like shot at the wedding. You know, he, Honestly. He didn't get an invitation to that wedding that I know of. Not that I'm aware yeah. of. All right, Tommy's absolution. Turns out that the part, part of the reason for the trip Tommy takes is that he's looking for absolution for the death of Grace. I don't know what to make of this scene because Tommy, for being as strong-minded as he is, Mm -hmm. am I to believe that he wants to literally hear a lie from the mouth of this, what is she, the Black Madonna? What is she? Uh, Something like that. I I wrote the Gypsy Queen. Yeah, let's just call her like the Gypsy Queen. But she essentially says there's no curse in the stone. She says she wants it. Essentially, he's asking her, would you want this? And she picks it up. She feels it. There's nothing wrong with this. She's like, yeah, take it. And so that kind of proves to you that there is no curse in the thing, right? Mm-hmm. That the reason she died was because of his actions for her death, right? And he says it. He yeah. says he pushed people too far. And she calls him out. She says, you want me to tell you the jewel is cursed? And then that her death won't be your fault. And I just kind of help, can't help but think she's setting him up to tell him a lie. She says, you, she's literally telling him, you want me to tell you that this, this jewel has a curse, so it's not your fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just can't bring myself to believe that Tommy can now be at peace with the lie. He knows it's a lie. He just, but he walks away in complete kind of, you know, I, I get that. I like, I understand that, but you know, it can also be. He, maybe he doesn't want to blame his brothers as being the catalyst for for this and this is a way of... Well, he can blame himself, though. Well, he, Think about it. Sort of. He could have taken Arthur and Polly's side and he, backtracked. Yeah, of course. Of, of course he could have, but at the same time, like, it's it was it was John Boy that, that did start the whole mess of things. And so maybe this is just a way of him kind of pivoting his his focus to now you know, focus on the Russians. I don't know, but let me let me put let me put you in this scenario. Let's just do like a little bit of role play here. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to use Michaela, but let's <laughs> let's use like I don't know something is your fault, like a you know uh-huh. somebody you know or like a co. Damn it, I don't want to put anybody as like a. I know you're gonna have whatever to your neighbor. Let's here. just say your neighbor <laughs> for some reason like they die and you think it and it's your fault. It's legitimately your fault. Mm-hmm. And you go to your pastor and you're like, look, I gave him my. <laughs> I got a car, and the brakes were cut, and I had no <laughs> idea. You know, actually, no, that's not a good scenario. No, you fired, it's not. <laughs> you you were too. You were an abusive boss at your workplace, and you push someone to the brink and you happen to be in a place with a neighbor that you liked (laughs) and the person that you fired or that quit that you pushed too far killed them and then you go to your pastor and you say hey look um these people gave me this car and i gave it to my neighbor and these people i really don't know them too well but they're kind of shady uh can you and they told me the car was cursed you know I need to sleep. Can you tell me the car is cursed? And the and the pastor tells you, yeah, the car was cursed. Would you be at <laughs> peace? Would you be at peace at that point? Like I, you answer that for me. I don't even know if that's a that's a good comparison. I'm a little lost by this. All right, let's use the there. exact same shit. You <laughs> give him a cursed jewel by some <laughs> Russians, and the Russian tells you that it's cursed. I would never want it, and you put it on their freaking neighbor's neck, 
and then mm-hmm. your enemies come in and they shoot you, your neighbor instead of you. And then you go to your pastor for an answer. Are you at peace with that or no? It's not that uh, difficult of a question for God's sake. No, no. Not in that scenario. Yeah, of course you're not going to be. So what I'm trying to but say is that what's the, what the hell is the, the point of going point? out to the countryside to hear that? I don't know. He could have told that to himself. I mean, he, he already went out there with, with that being the answer that he wanted. So I mean, he, in essence, he already was telling himself, I don't understand why he had to go to Madame Boswell to... Uh, I don't know. You ever call your, your parents or you ever hear your wife call her parents and ask them like a dumb question about something? Like, so no. to speak, like something that you know how to do, like you were cooking chicken and you're like, hey, uh-huh. look, I browned the chicken on both sides and uh, I want to <laughs> know if it's been, you know, whatever. Is it good to go? And then the mom's uh-huh. like, yeah, it's good. It's good. And then now you feel like more comfortable, even though you kind of deep down knew that the knew. chicken was cooked, but you yeah. wanted that reaffirmation. Is it that kind of moment for Tommy here? I'm kind of going deep maybe. on this absolution thing here. Y- you really are, honestly. Yeah. But I mean, maybe, yeah. right? Like, I mean, again, he already went there with, with the you know expectation that that was, that was the, the issue. Um, and I mean, the, the assassin was coming after Tommy. Yeah. Right. Like the assassin wasn't sent after, after grace. So something in, in the gypsy world, probably from a curse caused her to get hit instead of, instead of Tommy. So, I mean, maybe that was the case, you know, he already had that, you know, opinion that no, I'm like, I'm 99% sure that it is, it was cursed. Let me go talk to to this chick and just get that I one get last it. percent. You know, I think it would probably help to know if the, if he was, if she was like a mother figure to him mm-hmm. to get that answer. Well, let's move on. I've gone down that rabbit hole long enough. I'm so sorry to your to your neighbor <laughs> that does not exist and whoever else I has been sacrificed. Them, yeah, whoever, who, you know, whoever else I've sacrificed slippers. in this make believe story. <laughs> you uh, almost killed my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I did not. I explicitly said I would not use her as the example here. But <laughs> let's move on here. Uh, John and Arthur continue the rounds and they pick up Changretta. It's a really kind of tears at your heart kind of scene. And we kind of, mm-hmm. we get two scenes like this with the Nutley taking the cash and then Changretta's wife pleading for his life and saying, let him go, let him go. Yeah. And she says, I used to smack, smack you on the ass. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think she says that. I think I'm remembering correctly. She does. She does say uh, something like but that. But it's like really heart wrenching. But John Boy makes a point, or I think it's Arthur who says, your husband broke the code. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, Changretta knows the code. You don't go after someone's family, which mm-hmm. he wasn't trying to, but his assassin. <laughs> let's just say he's not the type of marksman that we see John Boy and Arthur freaking liquored up or you know, hitting every <laughs> bottle across a field. It makes you wonder how well they do if they weren't. Uh, right? I, actually, I think it's one of those cases, like, you ever play uh, pool? And you, of you course. Know, you play a little better when you got a couple drinks in you. Yeah, you're a little more loose. You're less stressed yeah. about the angle of the ball. Yeah, yeah, you play like a pool hall junkie. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, Tommy's been preparing. He shows up with Changretta in this very underground sewage looking area with a case of torture tools uh and you can't help but get the notion that tommy is trying to ramp himself up he's not the type of person that tortures somebody to death exactly yeah and he keeps talking all this smack to him like i'm gonna take out your tongues no i'm gonna take out your eyes i'm gonna cut you open i cut your balls off but then you bleed out too fast you know it's like Uh all these types of things yeah now, I mean, th- in this episode, and I mean, rightfully so, Tommy takes a very, very, very dark turn. Like, this is probably, like, the darkest thing Oh, yeah. It's the darkest we've seen him so far. And Absolutely. I got to say, it's a great monologue, by the way. If you're an oh, acting student and you got to do this monologue. <laughs> yeah, I've had to do those before. And this is a great one. I actually never thought about it that way. Yeah. And it ends with Arthur, who kind of plays the big brother role here and takes the bull. He absorbs the, the nastiness that Tommy was about to do because... In my opinion, in torturing Changretta, Tommy was going to dehumanize himself. Yeah, he would uh, lose himself even more than he than he kind of already has. And Arthur kind of realigns him, kills him. Mm-hmm. And John Boy tells him, hey, and we didn't kill his wife either. And Arthur mm-hmm. reminds Tommy, he says, we're not those type of men. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's that moment where you're like, all right, I am kind of rooting for the good guys here in some way. Yeah. 
Yeah. They're, yeah. So, <laughs> in quotes, good. Yeah. It, yeah. Some some quotes with uh, squigglies around as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 This this definitely needed to happen. Arthur definitely needed to step in and do this because. Uh, I think if Tommy went through with this, like Tommy would have, have gone past the point of no return. What is and not, not, not even so much for himself, but also for us just as viewers. Like, I don't think you can root for someone that who tortures somebody like that. Yes, absolutely. That absolutely. There is a certain point that characters can't go past because you will betray your audience and your fans. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, by the way, what are the chains that Tommy wears on the top of his sleeves? It's like very much a, did you notice that the chains that are like midway? It's very much uh, a, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I wish I knew. They're pretty cool. They are really cool. Yeah. Like, I need to know. Because next time All I'm right. donning a suit, I'm definitely buying a chain that goes around the wrist almost. Not the wrist, though. Like <laughs> It's like the bicep area almost. It is like the bicep, yeah. Yeah. At first, I thought it was like maybe he had something up there, but... Uh, I thought it was like, you know, maybe a, a watch yeah. or something along those lines, but I don't know. By the way... um. I, let's just gloss over the fact Tommy comes home and has like a night with Charlie, but you can't help but feel there's an emptiness there, right? Uh, mm. But there's a scene with Ada here in Tommy's uh, large estate that he has here. And I love this lounge area. It's like really nice, man. The f- furniture is so nice. The the table, everything is just so... This is what my office yeah. is going to look like. It looks so... It's just nice. The coffee table, everything. Even the desk that Ada's writing at. Mm-hmm. the lamp in the background everything is the wood panel the walls everything is so nice <laughs> we got to find a club slash lounge oh, like this down here dude if we could i would be there every week i thought you were gonna say every night <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i can afford that one yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um i do have an answer to to your question though it's called a sleeve garter and uh, it was used on shirts back this is in the reference to, to tommy's that- chain and the yeah yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. That's what it is. The sleeve guard to make sure that the length of your, well, your sleeve is going to fit the length of your arm properly. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of pull it up a little bit and you tie it off. To make sure that That's the shirt is. is the the right size for your arm is what you said? Length, yeah. So like if, if your shirt is a little too long, you might put that on, pull your shirt up a little bit and kind of tie it off. So there's like a little bit more slack up here mm-hmm. above your elbow, above where it's tied. And then it's, you know, at a good length down here. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I'll yeah. ever have that problem. I don't think so either. I mean, I'm sure we, we, we get fitted better nowadays anyways. Yeah, true, true, true. Well, Tommy has a scene with Ada here, uh, who's creepingly back in, creeping a little slightly into the family life. But yeah. I've always, I've always stood bored. by this. I've always said that Tommy and Ada have a special relationship. And mm-hmm. uh, Tommy even says he loves her I, at the end. He says, good night, I love you. Which I'm like, that's way too... It's over the top, Tommy. I was like, Tommy doesn't say he loves people. Actually, I've no. literally never, never heard him say that he loves one of his family members. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but she, the point of that conversation is Ada finds out that James Monklin is the name of somebody who's been leaking information to the Soviet embassy. And yeah. it's somebody that Tommy needs to meet with because he's talking about information that only the Economic League knows about, mm-hmm. which is the priest and Patrick Jarvis. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tommy goes and meets with him, but I, I do want to stop and say that Tommy notices that Ada's taking this interest back, and I think he's also noticing how useful she is and effective she is when she puts her mind to something. Yeah, and uh, he invites her to take a job on the legitimate side of things for Shelby Company Limited in Boston. Yeah, or if not in Boston, then having to do with their expansion to Boston. Yeah, I also. You know, have kind of noticed every time that that Tommy needs Ada to get involved with something, it's it always has to do with communist, with some communist socialist. thing. Yeah. yeah, all the time. Let's talk about James Monklin. Uh, Tommy meets him in the cell. He got, gets him arrested. So very similar tactic as to what the priest did to him when mm-hmm. he arrested him, and pretty much has a pretty epic line where he says, "I need to know how you know about the robbery." Uh, and who's the rat within the economic league? And he's like, they're very dangerous people, Mr. Shelby. And he says, well, you have to decide who's more dangerous, the economic league in the future at some time mm-hmm. or the Peaky Blinders at 1143 because <laughs> he checks his watch. <laughs> he doesn't choose wisely because he won't see 1144. Yeah. So, that's such a good line, man. 
That's a good it line. is. It really makes you rethink the situation, though, because you, you still might be more afraid of the economic league. I, I would say you would be. You should be more afraid of the economic league yeah. because they strike with such, you know, lack of concern for anything. Not even like we saw. They left literally a crematorium card under Charlie's head. Like, mm-hmm. So, but you got to choose and just tell Tommy and just get the hell out of town immediately after go to america become an informant do whatever you got to do you know mm-hmm. get out of there or go work for winston churchill and be protected i don't know you already <laughs> he already got himself in a bad situation to begin with it's kind of like you got to sleep with it uh yeah we find out in this episode also as there's a lot of changes going on with arthur you know he's now the conflicted family man he's he's become kind of like this conflicted christian or mm-hmm. catholic i'm not sure i think they're christian um, he 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 grew up catholic but she's not she's some sort of christian yeah well we find out that linda's pregnant and as it is we've already seen linda kind of asserting this pressure on arthur to separate himself from the dirty work that mm-hmm. he is enlisted to do with the shelbys yeah and now she has a kid and in the in the celebration that Arthur's with all the guys in that scrapyard, you can see it on Tommy's face where he says goodbye to him, which yeah. I think is twofold. I, f- I find it as almost like a, oh, she has she has his grips on him now, like he's gone, you know, in terms of his connection to this business. Mm-hmm. And I also see it as almost like a, I'm going to try my brother and see what he really wants because I feel like he can't live without this either. Like this is all talk. I like, guess he wants to be with Linda, but at the end of the day, He's a Peaky Blinder. He can't yeah. live without what he does for the Peaky Blinders. So I found it as kind of both, you know, like he's not yeah. giving him the satisfaction of this warm celebration. He kind of needs him to feel like it's business as usual in a sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you make of yeah. Arthur's celebration of? of well, the, I mean, my my thought with uh, maybe this is just be, me being a little bit cynical, but I kind of thought you? that cynical. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Who would have guessed? <laughs> I kind of thought it was um, Linda trying to get more leverage on him to get her way. Yeah, with him. I, I agree having with you a, here. Having a kid. I agree yeah, with you. See? I agree with you. I mean, I just find that Lim- Linda sees them as like a ticket to whatever she wants. And she's kind of yeah. hiding her eyes, like see no evil type of thing. Hear no evil, see mm-hmm. no evil type of thing. Yeah. As she controls Arthur like a little puppet master. Yeah, I, I I do think that Tommy, like in, in what he said, even even with him just saying goodbye, Arthur, like it's almost like his own way of supporting Arthur, because I think he knows, especially in this episode right now, I think he one hundred percent understands, you can't have it both, you cannot have both. Ah, that's a really good observation, Zach. Thank you. That's a really I have good my moments. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good observation. It's. It's yeah, it's it's kind of also playing along the lines of wow, his life is really coming together and mine is falling apart. I just had mm-hmm. that. I knew that joy that he has. Mm-hmm. And that's been ripped from me. Yeah. And so if you want it, you have to move away from this from mm-hmm. this life otherwise. Yep. It'll consume you. Yeah. But to that note, Tommy really never makes a decision for other people. He leaves them a decision to make for themselves, at least mm-hmm. in his family. Other people know. They're forced to agree with whatever he wants to do. Yeah. All right, that's true. Let's move on to Tommy and the Russians, or Tommy and the Russians in the Economic League and the whatever the hell these guys are. The perverted reverend. Yeah, no, don't call him a reverend. He's a priest. Um, priest, sorry, my apologies. He goes to meet with the Russians, the priest, and the MP, I think. And they talk about, well, they're having dinner. And Tommy's coming in and essentially stealing the show by giving an update on all of the mission because really the dinner's there to discuss this mission and how they're going to get these weapons out into the Mm -hmm. fighters right so that these people Mm -hmm. can go back and continue to be royals yeah but tommy comes in in a such a sense that he really steals the show where he's kind of showing like i'm the guy who runs shit around here i'm the one who gets shit Mm -hmm. done and these guys sit here and drink your soup and do whatever they got to do and -hmm. i think that's why you start to see the priest interrupting him constantly and he even asserts to take um credit because he says oh yes this is the plan we formulated together i made sure that it would you know kind of taking that credit in front of him but he's losing face little by little because even the mp is ignoring him who's with him there 
Yeah. Right? Uh, and it's in this dinner where Tommy, we find out that the priest is the rat, according to James Monklin, which was the name that Ada got of the guy who's been leaking information to the Soviet embassy. I know that was kind of like a, a long sentence, but at the end of the day, what Tommy wants here is to kill this priest. Mm-hmm. And he wants permission from these royals to do so. That's why he passes that napkin with the I have secrets to what's her name? The older, the older woman who I is the boss. I don't remember the, the man's wife, whatever. That yeah. Can you look that up? Uh, I know his yeah. name is Leon, I think, or something like that. And she's Tatiana, but I forget the the wife's name. It's something very Russian. Uh, let's see. This is uh, Isabella. Isabella. That's well, not really that Russian. It's her aunt. Uh, so, oh, that's right. It's, well, yeah, it's her aunt. Never mind. She's, they're, they're really great aunts and uncles because they continue to try to like enlist their niece to seduce Tommy constantly, mm-hmm. constantly, constantly, constantly. And I'm not going to lie, she's really pretty, but she's out of line. She's constantly saying like out of pocket stuff, like yeah. essentially questioning Tommy's love for his wife, which is so crass. Distasteful. It's distasteful. And, you know, Tommy reminds her that Grace is still with him. And he's telling, she's telling him, don't trust these people. Mm-hmm. And that's how the episode ends. With Tommy walking away, asking for permission to kill the priest. And you kind of see where he's at, where he doesn't quite trust these people, but he's still mm-hmm. on a mission and needs to complete this mission for the country or for Winston Churchill. Yeah. I mean, all things considered, this is a much better episode. And I think I've said this every episode this season. It's a much better episode than I really do remember. It's definitely not... This is top tier peaky season. I think the only season that I'm just kind of meh about is season four. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's the only season that I'm like, eh. That was okay. You know, I did wish yeah. that they were coming back for a season seven. I will tell you that. I wish that there wasn't a movie, a movie that was coming out, and I wish it was a, a season seven. And who knows? They may change their mind. They can change their mind. I don't see why they wouldn't change their mind. Um, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, why the hell not? I, I, I would love another season just because there's more content. Not because of but, the content. Think about the storytelling. I we can't yeah. we can't go this far. We can't go this far. Yeah, that's not even talking true. about it. It's true. Whatever. Well, you'll you'll find out about it. It's not a you gotta listen. No, you gotta. No, you gotta <laughs> listen to all of our season six commentary that's already up on the story archives. Uh, podcast channels and uh, <clears throat> you'll hear all of our opinions and thoughts about season six as uh, as, you, as soon as you watch it because it's going to release in North America on June 10th June which 10th. is 10 days or nine nine days that I is guess, next Friday next Friday yeah. and this is going to be up on tomorrow the second Thursday. yeah the Thursday June 2nd yeah yeah um, well, we got two more episodes no three more episodes to go we have yeah. episodes four five and six which we, we will be pretty much done with the season by next Thursday, uh, recording and rolling into season four. Four. Which is funny. Four we're gonna roll. Season. We're gonna roll into our least favorite season. But we may we <laughs> may be pleasantly surprised and remember that that season was better than. than if it's what anything it was. like this has been so far, I think we'll be. I think we will be pleasantly pleasantly surprised. I hope so. Honestly, in between this show, I've been watching some Stranger Things. Damn, mm-hmm. it's horrifying. Oh man, the, the new Stranger Things is so dark. Yeah, I told you we we started watching on Friday last week and finished on Saturday. Oh my god, it's so dark. <laughs> yeah, the second half of this is supposed to come out um, in July. I might I might not watch it at all, and you know what? I'll watch it because I'm gonna have so much to do in June that it's worth yeah. it. Yeah, it's it's worth it to watch it. Um, let's do a two not, let's do a two episode recap or a three episode yeah. recap of the of the full season. Yeah, we should do something for it's sure. It's so damn dark, uh, though. It it really did get a, it did get very dark. I mean, and I mean, all the kids are growing up. It kind of reminds me Harry of Potter, Harry Potter. Right? Ah, yeah, exactly. This is why we're brothers. So this is why same we're brothers. Time. <laughs> I was thinking the yeah. same exact thing. It was like that shift in Harry Potter from the second book to the third book, mm-hmm. specifically the fourth book is when it starts to get there. But yeah. if they're going to continue, I don't know how many more seasons they got in the in the plans here. I, I kind of think the next one might be the last one. 
I figured that when they graduated high school, that would be the end of it. So did I. Aren't they honestly. freshmen? They're freshmen in this one. So I figure maybe two or three more seasons of Stranger mm. Things, which I think maybe. is dragging it out too much. I, I think it's right. Look, honestly, I do think that maybe they can they do a time could skip. really well close this completely off at the end of the, the, the next season. Like, I think I think they could be done. Well, if they, if they come back and, and go farther, I just think they're just going overboard. At that so, point. Some of the characters at this point feel like if we push them too further out, that their mm-hmm. age is just too much. Like Nancy, uh, we're talking about Stranger Things now. And not Peaky Blinders, but yeah. we'll have to we'll have to have like a one off episode about Stranger Things or something like that on, on our Story Archives channel. So, all right, let's, let's get into that. the categories now on episode three. I know what my favorite scene, but now a couple of other lines came to my came up mm-hmm. that I actually really did enjoy, um, but they're not going to top my favorite scene. So, of course. go ahead, ask Bef- before I before I get into those, Mister Nutley, his name is Ralph. Einson or mm-hmm. something along those lines. He's been in a lot of things, not really major characters from what I understand though. But he's been in The Witch, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, uh The Green Knight, Guardians of the Galaxy. Ah, who do you play in Guardians of the Galaxy? He was just a Ravager pilot. So I don't think he was anybody that was a primary character in there, but he he was also in um, some of the most recent Star Wars uh, movies. He was like a senior First Order officer, or things like that. So I remember him. him from Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Yep. Kingsman. He was a policeman in that. Okay. I'm, okay. His face. That's why it's coming. It's in my subconscious. His face is there. Yeah. It's because you've seen it a bunch of yeah. times. He's just never like, oh, that's who it is. Uh, he was also in um, Game of Thrones as. Dagmar Cleftjaw, whoever that is. Do you know who that is? I'm looking it up now. Dagmar Cleftjaw. Mm. I think this is the guy Theon fights. I don't even know who Theon is, so. Yeah. I'll know at some point. All right, let's get into Anyways, the Anyways, uh, number one, as always, best scene. You spoke to Michael before us. <laughs> what? You spoke to Michael for us. It's because Michael deals with legitimate business, John. That's the scene right there. It's a great scene. It's the, it is one of my top. Because my wife took a bullet meant for me. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, man. That, that scene is that scene is goaded in terms of P.E. Blinder status. Yeah. That's up there yeah. with almost said everything. <laughs> yeah. It's up there with it's that. It's up there. It is up there. It it, it it was one of my favorites, but the one that I did pick is Oh, not favorite. that? All right, no, I, I, went and I went off uh, and did something a little different on this one. So so the one that I picked was actually – Tommy talking to his son in the in the caravan ah, about his mother. I like yeah. that. That's a good. Yeah. That's a good zag. It's a good zag, yeah, right? right? I like yeah, that. I had to go left on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like I like when you zag into like something I'm not expecting in there. Yeah, that's that's nice. Thank I like you, that scene you. as well. I I also like. I love the line with the. Are you more scared of the economic league in the future or the Peaky Blinders at eleven forty three? Because the whole thing, he's like taking out his clock. He's like, unfortunately, we're dangerous too. I'm kind of butchering mm-hmm. that now, but I'm just kind of we're we're, we're more dangerous right now. So yeah, exactly, uh, do you want to live the next minute or the next year or so? You know what they say. I think Clint Eastwood has a line that says, "There's two types of people in this world: a man with a loaded gun, one with a shovel, something like that." <laughs> Let me see. Go on to the next category. Well, the next one was was best line of the episode. So is that is that your favorite there? Oh yeah, absolutely. The um, two kinds of people: those with loaded guns and those who dig. You dig. <laughs> That's great, man. That's great. Um, yeah, no, my favorite line is from the the explosion argument with John and uh, and Tommy. And yeah, honestly, so it could be John's too. It's like secret service. 
Secret fucking service. service. Blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. But you don't tell us shit. We're a bunch of a couple of toy soldiers. Do this, John. Do that, John. Kill your fucking teacher, John. (laughs) (laughs) That's my favorite. That's the one that I wrote down. It was that that whole line. (laughs) That's a good line, man. Secret fucking service. Blah, blah, blah. But you don't tell us shit. (laughs) <laughs> oh it was great i think that is john's shining moment you know what the awkward scene for me is is michael pointing the gun at people's faces and the weird oh, the really weird awkward. facial expressions he has on his face as he's like pointing his gun and like rubbing oh, yeah. on arthur's nostril it's like a, uh-huh. yeah awkward scene there with michael very yeah, it was very awkward i mean I'll, I'll go back and say it again whatever face john boy was making (laughs) i i can't handle it it was just the funniest damn thing i've seen in this uh most memorable character of the episode unless you had something else you wanted to say no tommy is it's just tommy just go tommy it's tommy uh tommy would be the typical one um but if i had to if i had to pick somebody else i would say maybe not most memorable but one of the more interesting characters in this, ju- simply in regards to the fact that I think you know there's going to be a change, is Michael. Yeah, I couldn't disagree with you there. I, I just think that Mike- Tommy has too many moments. He has the explosion with John. He has just the grieving that he's doing. Um, his talk with his son, mm-hmm. with the with the gypsy queen. Um, his torture scene of the Changreta and his little monologue that he gives there. Uh is seen with Ada. It's just like scene after scene, and this every episode has scene after scene with Tommy. But yeah, I mean, this he's one definitely has the memorable attention on this one. Well, this yeah. one has his a lot of did die. has a lot of memorable scenes, right? Like yeah. more memorable scenes than the wedding. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean the 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 wedding episode was literally like the entire thing was a wedding. So yeah, it's kind of it was it's kind of one of those hard ones to distinguish between you know one scene from another because it it's almost like it it kind of reminds me of the movie 1917 not that it was all shot in a single shot or anything like that but it's like this one timeline and you're following it in a very linear way Mm -hmm. like i don't think there was a lot of jumping back and forth and jumping around in that first episode of this season no no there wasn't it was one place and just a lot of stuff happening in one place yeah well i think that about does it unless there's any other memorable moments that, that kind of stood out to you and i mentioned any, uh, any memorable mentions? no let's wrap this up because we still got three more episodes to go and uh i'm excited man i'm excited our journey is almost coming to a close here we, i know we have another season to go but yeah feels we have been doing this for almost half a year and so it kind of feels like we're literally we're literally closing the the end something we need some good irish whiskey <sighs> Bro, to cap do. this off you know yeah I've had good. I've had Bushmills, and I mean Jameson is typically my go-to, but we'll have to find something. We'll have to find something. We'll do some research. Here. Let's do some research onto yeah. like the nicest bottle Tommy drinks in the show. But yeah, for all right, sure. close this out, Zach. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for listening to season three, episode three of the Peaky Blinders podcast by Story Archives. You can find this podcast anywhere you find podcasts: Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts. You can find us on Instagram at Story Archives. And you can visit our website at storyarchives.themidnightexchange.com, which brings us to our podcast network, The Midnight Exchange. You can visit our website there at themidnightexchange.com. And there's a whole bunch of links to other podcasts, social media, things like that. And if you want to send us an email, you can drop us an email at podcast at themidnightexchange.com. Awesome. Uh... Also, subscribe to our other channels, our Lupin show and our Story Archive show. And please, what is the word I'm looking for? Rate? Rate our show? Rate and subscribe? Yeah, we need you to rate our show so that it can show up more on the search engines of Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And uh seems like Spotify is like by far our most popular platform for listeners. Yeah, but uh, I think so. It would really I help. Think, I think a big We'd huge case is over in the UK. If, too, if you're so. one of those people listening to these on a weekly basis, take a couple of seconds and give us a nice little review. It would be very appreciated. And if we could shout you out by name, we would. You could email us and let us know you did it. And we'll shout you hey, out by name. If you add a comment. You can add a comment? We can. You can add a comment. At least in Apple Podcasts, you can add a comment. So if you if you give us a little rating there and add a comment, we'll shout you out. All How right. About that? Sounds good. That sounds like that's a solid deal right there. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Awesome. See, I'm just loaded with all good ideas this one. You're really yeah, you're on fire, man. You're on fire. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you all for <laughs> listening and tuning in per usual. 
and stay peaky until next time. Peace.